Hello, Kim 120 students. This is the first lecture of a new semester. And this class is going to progress from chapter one through chapter eight, and we will cover a little bit of chapter nine. Chapter one is aptly titled Chemical Foundations. So much of this chapter is going to be review, but it's building skills that you are going to utilize for the rest of the semester. So especially if it's been a while since you've taken a class that was math based, I really encourage you to focus on mastering the skills of this chapter, especially metric conversions and dimensional analysis. Um, it is going to set you up for success. You really, really want to get those down. So um, let's get started, shall we? So I know students take this class for a variety of reasons, mostly because you have to, and that's great, right? Why do you have to take chemistry? Because it is a foundational science and it makes you a better problem solver and critical thinking. And problem solving and critical thinking are skills that will benefit you for the rest of your life regardless of what career you choose. So that's my philosophy, that's the way that I teach this course, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. Speaking of a lot of fun, this is a great quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's, there are more water molecules in a glass of water so individual H2O molecules and a glass of water, then there are glasses of water in the ocean. You so just take a moment, let that sink in a little bit. And hopefully, right about now, your mind is kind of being blown by that statement. And the reason why I like to start every semester with this quote is that the biggest challenge in studying chemistry is that you're asked to think about life and the things that surround you on an atomic level. And that's not easy to do. Like when you read this quote, you have to read it a couple times in order to really start to process what it's telling you. Um, you know, you are drinking in one sip of water just an enormous number of molecules. And so as we progress through this class, you're going to, excuse me, so many molecules, um, <laughs> you are going to develop a deeper understanding of the way atoms combine to form molecules and then the way molecules interact with each other in chemical reactions. And so if you're wondering how chemistry is relevant to your life, literally every breath you have ever taken in your life has been the result of chemical reactions. So it's important and we're going to crush it. Okay. So let's start by looking at a couple different molecules. The first one I wanna draw your attention to is benzene. And benzene is a very cool molecule. Um, you have this six carbon ring here, which is very prevalent in a lot of larger bio uh, biochemical molecules or biochemically active molecules. So, Benzene is a organic solvent, doesn't matter if that doesn't mean anything to you, but let's just say that it does have a melting point, melting point being that point at which something goes from a solid to a liquid, and that melting point is at 5.05 degrees Celsius, right? So that's like just above the freezing point of water. So at room temperature, benzene is going to be in um, an aqueous form or liquid form. Okay, so if you look at this benzene molecule and then you compare it to graphene, they have this same kind of hex, uh, hexagon structure, right? Six-sided carbon ring. The difference is that benzene it, each carbon is bonded to a hydrogen. It is a relatively like quite small molecule. Whereas our graphene, each one of those carbons is bonded to another carbon and you have this really tight woven structure. So graphene's melting point is 3,652 degrees Celsius. Otherwise known as like really, 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 really hot. So we have structures that are similar, but the way that they're bonded together, the sheer um, 
connect number of connections that they have contributes to this very different chemical property. And this is a great way of illustrating a fundamental concept in chemistry. And that is that form defines function. This is a principle not just in chemistry, also in biology. So form defines function. Benzene, graphene, very similar. They have the same like base, the benzene ring, but very, very different chemical properties, different forms. So benzene and, and graphene are used very differently, right? Because they have different forms, they have different functions. And now, as we are developing new technologies, our understanding of the function and utility of molecules is just really dramatically expanding. So this is an image of a scanning tunneling mi electron microscope. It's a really, really cool um, instrument. I highly recommend that you just like do a quick Wikipedia search. Check it out it'll blow your mind. So the more that we develop technologies, the more we can start to really understand, and that's an unfortunate color, hold on, really understand the way that these molecules form. So here we have our hexane, and, um, and this is a, sorry, this is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of graphene and so each one of these kind of points here would be a carbon and these bridges that you see are those bonds and bonds are formed by electrons so really what you're looking at there is an electron bridge so 50 years ago it would have been impossible to even like maybe not to imagine that we would be able to visualize graphene at this level, but it would have been just really mind blowing. I mean, it still kind of is that we can do this, but the more that we can visualize something, the more we can understand things at the atomic level, which is so conceptually difficult, the further we can push science. So graphene, really interestingly, there's a paper that came out in 2017, um, where they took two layers of graphene, exactly two, no more, no less, and it could withstand being cut by a diamond. Pretty cool. So diamonds are our toughest material. And as we continue to experiment with graphene, there is this not implausible future where we could make, you know, very advanced body armor that would allow us to explore new parts of our planet, um, hopefully be used for things like that instead of like, I don't know, things like war, right? And I'm a big nerd, so this is your first indication if the pineapples on my shirt didn't tell you already. Okay, so I was just talking about the way we develop new technologies, we push science forward, we're learning new things, and that is only possible because of the scientific method. So I think a lot of people get frustrated with science because the narrative often is like this group of researchers discovered something and then another group of researchers set, come in and say, well, that's not the whole picture. And it goes in this back and forth and more and more people are getting involved in the conversation. And I think it can be really kind of frustrating for the layman um, or just for many people who aren't in the science field. But what's important and what I think we should focus on is the fact that science is this extremely critical endeavor where we are pushing our boundaries of what we understand about our planet and our existence. And so we're always going into these new frontiers, always, um, again, pushing boundaries. And it's good that the pursuit of science, the pursuit of knowledge is one in which a community has, of scientists have been built that encourages being critical of new discoveries, of saying, okay, what you say makes sense, 
but where are the holes? Where are pieces of information? Um, where are we missing pieces of information? Where are there parts that need to be strengthened in order to better understand what's happening? So science really is a dialogue and the language of that dialogue is the scientific method. So you have probably seen a flowchart similar to this, but I think it, it really warrants um, discussing right now because you're studying chemistry. Chemistry is a science and science is pushed forward by the scientific method. So all science begins with observation. It is essentially observation, oop, sorry, observation, wait for it, pen in hand, is collecting data. Right, and this might not be, and usually it isn't in the observation stage of the scientific method. This is just like noticing the world around you and saying, huh, that's funny. And then you continue to notice the things around you. You continue to observe similar phenomena. And from that, you develop a hypothesis, right? Which is basically like suggesting an explanation. And then we go on to the experiment, which is where you test that explanation. And in testing, you get more data, you get more questions, you get more possible explanations, And so as you start to try to answer one question, you're actually just entering a whole new realm of inquiry. And that's why this figure has this drawn as a cyclical thing. Okay, I'm never going to ask you questions about the steps of the scientific method, but I would not be doing my job if I didn't get excited about science and uh, the way we move it forward. Okay. So I think the scientific method is something that when you first hear about it, or even in this like short spiel that I've given, it's um, very theoretical, hypothetical, and it's hard to imagine how it's actually applied to real experiments. And so I wanna just quickly go over an awesome experiment. This is a prime example of what we call elegant experimental design, which is where you have a really important question and you develop an experiment that is so simple and so clearly just allows you to test that hypothesis that they they just become famous. Um, so Hershey Chase, many of you might already be familiar with this experiment. If you're not, you can you can check it out. Right? We love the Google. Um, so kind of thinking back to that last slide where we talked about the steps of the scientific method. In the Hershey Chase Blender exp experiment, the, sorry, I can do better. Um, the observation is that there is a molecule of inheritance. Right? Kids look like their parents. Flowers that are pink tend to have, well, right, white, red, or pink um, offspring. That was not the best example. But we see that, you know, cats have babies that look like cats, right? So there's some molecule that is being inherited, that is causing speciation, that is um, allowing children to look like their parents. And so the hypothesis at the time of the Hershey Chase uh, Blender experiment this, was that it's either going to be protein or DNA. Right, so we knew about DNA for a long time. Um, and we knew about protein for a long time. We know that they are critical for cellular growth, but we didn't know which one was the molecule of inheritance. 
So the Hershey Chase Blender experiment starts with background information, like every experiment does. And so part of that background information is that if you're interested in protein, protein contains sulfur. DNA contains phosphorus. DNA does not contain sulfur. Protein does not contain phosphorus, right? So these are like differential characteristics between these two molecules. They both have carbon, they both have hydrogen, they both have nitrogen, um, but phosphorus and sulfur are unique to them. So that's background information. And then an additional thing that Hershey Chase had to use was a tool which is called a bacteriophage. So phage means, um, virus or eater of, so eater of bacteria. Um, and let's just really quickly kind of blow up this structure. Perfect, kind of looks like a little lunar lander. Cool, let's give him three legs. Um, tripods are much more stable. So what I just drew would be called the capsid, right? And that is all protein. So that's like the um, structure that's basically just acting as a vehicle for the um, DNA or RNA of the virus to get around. And that is contained inside. So here you can see we have the DNA labeled in green. So it's a radioactive label that, um, a radioactive phosphorus that was labeled. And then we have sulfur that is labeled for the protein. So you have these two different conditions. One is bacteriophage with the DNA labeled, one is bacteriophage with the protein label. So you give bacteriophage the thing that they wanna eat, which is bacteria, and the way bacteriophage work is they dock on the outside of the bacteria, they inject their DNA, um, and the rest is history, right? Eventually the cell lice, Likes it, or there's a couple different things that can happen, but this isn't a virology class, so I'll get on with it. So Hershey Chase, they allow for several or many generations of the bacteria to grow, right? Bacteria grow really quickly, so let's say it's 24 hours. Then they come back into the lab and they use centrifugal force to shear off the, um, the capsids, which are on the outside of the cell. So what they're doing there is essentially just like throwing the bacteria in a blender, blender experiment. So at the end, they analyze these two groups of bacteria and they find that those bacteria that were infected by viruses that, um, or excuse me, that with bacteriophage with the protein labeled have no radioactive sulfur. However, those bacteria that were um, uh, in the same container as the, the viruses with DNA labeled do have radioactive sulfur. So multiple generations, that radioactive sulfur carrying through, molecule of inheritance, elegant experimental design, so, so cool. So science is active, it incorporates past knowledge, right, the makeup of DNA and proteins, and we use that in conjunction with new tools, right, it could be new forms of microscopy, like that scanning tunneling micrograph that I showed you, or it could be something really old that we've known along, about for a long time, like bacteriophage. So um, if you're a creative person who really likes to ask questions and solve problems, maybe you should consider a career in science because it is the coolest not bias at all. Okay, so science moves forward with experiments. Experiments require measurable data. So there's two kind of ways of collecting data. One or two classifications of data, I should say. So I should say. So one is qualitative. So qualitative data would be like a ranking system where you were to rank from like one to five the attractiveness of a flower, right? That is like qualitative information. Um, quantitative information would be the length of the stamen on that flower, right? So measurable data. And um, 
In chemistry, we are interested in quantitative data. So qualitative are kind of attributes, observations, quantitative, measurable data. So every measurement is going to consist of a number and a unit. If it's just a number, it doesn't mean anything. If it's just a unit, it doesn't mean anything. So you need both a magnitude, which is the number, and you need the scale that it belongs with. And this is just, these are some units. Cool, we'll talk a lot more about units in the second lecture. Why? Because without a unit, a number is meaningless. So one thing that I really like to, um, to use when I talk to students is, wait for it, um, this concept that if, if I were to ask you, right, you come to me and you're like, wow, Sam, I really didn't do well on that quiz. My first question is going to be, how much time did you study? And if you answered four, I would be like, I don't know what that means, and please explain. So if you said, like, four hours, I would be like, yeah, you know, this is a difficult class. Studying a whole chapter for four hours probably isn't going to be enough to do well on a quiz. If you said four days, I would say, okay, well, what did you really struggle with? Why didn't, um, why didn't you email me? And then we could have talked about some things. Um, so remember, you can always email me, and we can always talk about some things. <laughs> so um, the point being that without the unit, four doesn't mean anything. I don't know. I don't know what four means. Okay. So two parts to measurable data. Magnitude, which is our number, scale, which is our unit. We're going to spend the rest of this lecture just talking about numbers and how we make sure that the numbers that we report are accurate. So there's two kind of concepts that we, and I'm definitely guilty of this, use pretty much interchangeably, and that's accuracy and precision. So for something to be precise, it would be, it specifically means that um, like a data point is in agreement with other data points. So you can think about that as like human error. If you are supposed to measure five milliliters and let's say you're having an off day and there's a large range in that five milliliter measurement, you are not being precise. Those measurements are not in alignment with each other. You can think of that also as an example of reproducibility, right? Not having reproducible data. So that's precision, data points agreeing with each other. Accuracy is a data point agreeing to an actual known value. So if you're measuring five milliliters and it's on a graduated cylinder that your like prankster friend went and scraped off all of the numbers and rewrote them in a convincing way where five milliliters was actually 10 milliliters, it doesn't matter how precise you are, you are not accurate, and so your data is off. So in chemistry, in all scientific um, endeavors, research, science, we are always looking to be both accurate and precise. So I think of precision as being human error, accuracy being instrument, um, calibration error. Okay, so just two, two concepts to think about. Um, and the reason why I include this in our lecture and why your textbook mentions it is that when we're working through our labs, you really need to, to think along every step, like, am I, am I being precise in my measurements? And then when you're thinking about potential sources of error, one of those things might be, okay, I took all of these um, measurements using an analytical scale. When's the last time that scale was calibrated, right? So these are the kinds of questions uh, that you ask yourself all the time, especially when you uh, find your experiment isn't working. Okay, so numbers need to be accurate and precise to be meaningful. This image here is of a burette. So the way burettes work is you fill them up and then you um, measure the amount of liquid that has been dispensed. So if you look at this burette, this is a nice little zoomed in um, portion. So you can see that the burette is marked by one milliliter. That's those long marks. And then these halfway marks or hash marks are um, a tenth of a milliliter. 
So looking at the meniscus, which is the bottom of the kind of bowl that you get here, that's called the meniscus. Um, that's always where we measure our volumetric measurements. Oop. Let's just let that disappear real quick. There we go. Um, you can see that, okay, this is 20.0 and this is 20.1. You can see that it's like, I don't know, about halfway between that 0.1 and 0.2. So in science, we are always trying to be as precise as possible. And so the rule is that we record all certain digits plus the first uncertain digits. So in this particular example, our certain digit would be our 20.1, excuse me. So 20.1, this is 20, this is 0.1. For sure you've dispensed more than that, but you haven't dispensed more than 20.2. So somewhere in between there is your actual value. So, our first uncertain digit would be that hundredths place. So this is a situation where if you were in a lab, you might like screw your eyes up and, and talk to your um, lab partner and say, what do you think? Um, is that 20.15 or is that something different? I adopted a puppy in January. He's just learning his big boy voice and sometimes he likes to show it off, so. He'll settle down, sorry. <laughs> okay, so perfectly fine to say um, and expected to go out to that first uncertain digit. Now the difference would be is if you and your lab partner were like, okay, that's 20.15623 milliliters, right? Numbered unit, that would just be fraudulent, right? All of these numbers here are totally made up. And any time in science that you are totally making something up, that is called fraud, and nobody likes that. That's terrible penmanship. Okay, so why is this significant? Why is it important to go off to this, this first um, digit of uncertainty in our measurements in the lab? The reason why is that we wanna be as accurate as possible, and we assume that the measurement being reported is, um, is reflective of the actual value plus or minus one. And, and sometimes that'll be otherwise indicated depending on um, what like paper you're reading or how the data was collected, but you can always assume that it's plus or minus one unless otherwise stated. So in this example, graduated cylinder, so now we're measuring the volume that we have in our graduated cylinder. We can see, all right, this is three, this is four, and there's one, two, three, Four in between, so that's two, four, six, eight, ten, right? So it's divided into um, uh, 0.2 milliliters. So I have my three, this would be 3.2, this would be 3.4. Okay, so if my partner and I were in the lab and we're feeling lazy and we're just like, all right, let's just call that three. What you're actually indicating is that your range of uncertainty being plus or minus one, that your real value is somewhere between two milliliters and four milliliters, which is pretty huge, right? That's a 50% difference between um, your largest value and smallest. Now let's say we were using the graduated cylinder more precisely and we said that it was, okay, it's 3.4. That is telling me that my range of uncertainty is 3.3 milliliters through 3.5 milliliters. Much, much, much more precise than that first option. But I still could have gone to that first digit of uncertainty, which would leave me with 3.45. And that gives my range of 3.44 to 3.46. And this really does a great job of illustrating why we want to be as precise as possible with our measurements. Right, that range of uncertainty is much smaller. That means that the accuracy of that individual data point is better. And that's minimizing or 
reducing as much as possible your source of error. And so as you use values like this in um, mathematical operations, those sources of error compound. So you want to try to minimize them as much as possible. Okay, so that's how we think of um, taking accurate measurements when we're collecting data. And then we're going to use those data points in like downstream applications, like I was just saying. And so the scientific community has agreed upon a way of evaluating numbers and determining how, um, basically how many digits you can report your um, number to. So before we can get to the application and, and, and mathematical operations, we need to start with just talking about um, the rules for significance. Okay, so we have significant numbers and non and unsignificant or insignificant or not significant numbers. Um, and unsignificant is not a word, so it's not that. <laughs> um, okay, so significant numbers are going to be any non-zero. Right? Every other rule here applies to zeros. If it's not a zero, it's significant all the time. Boom, done, close the book. Okay, so if you have a number like 430, that, sure, that can be a six. You have three significant figures, right? Which I'm just gonna abbreviate as SF. Okay? Now, let's go to this other side to our not significant figures um, because these other significant rules are a little more nuanced. So digits that are not significant are going to be zeros. And in the first case, we have leading zeros. So a leading zero would be like this, right? So you have these zeros that are really just acting like placeholders. Why are they acting like placeholders? Because we could represent this number with um, scientific notation, which is the first part of our second. Uh, or no, that is the end of this lecture. Um, so we could represent this with scientific notation, or we could just change the scale, right? So an example of changing the scale would be if this was meters, I could say, okay, well, that's 0 0.5 millimeters. Or I could say that that is 500 micrometers, right? So we can change, change the scale to represent the same number. So all of those micrometers, all of those zeros are not significant. The only significant figure is our five, so that's one significant figure. Trailing zeros would be like in this example. So here we have one, two, three, four, five zeros that are not significant. I can represent that with scientific notation, right? So in this case, that would be like 500,000. I could change the scale. Uh, scientific notation would be five times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, right? And we'll review scientific notation shortly. Okay, so it's leading and trailing zeros. Now, this consideration is a little more nuanced and I like to call it a zero sandwich. So that is a zero between two significant digits. So that would be like five, zero, five. This zero is significant because 505 is very different than 55, right? You need that zero in order to have that number. This next one is a little bit more nuanced and that's gonna be a zero after a decimal point. So if you have five, Point zero, this zero is not considered a trailing zero. It's not the same as if you just had 50. Why? Because we have this decimal place. So that 5.0 is telling me the precision of that value 5, right? So if we think about that plus or minus 1 precision, uh, or excuse me, plus or minus 1 uh, range of uncertainty, Having 5.0 tells me that it's somewhere between 4.9 and 5.1, right? So that zero is really, really significant. So if you have a non-zero number and a decimal place before those zeros, it's going to be significant. 
and we'll do some examples in a heartbeat. Now this last one, exact numbers, are gonna be things that you can count. So if you have five people at your house, that is an exact number. Exact numbers are considered to be, have like infinite significant figures. So these are not going to be limiting factors when you are um, doing mathematical operations. Another example would be like there are 12 inches in a foot. Right, that is an exact number. Um, that's called a conversion factor, which is something that we will talk about in lecture two. So exact numbers, infinite number of significant figures. Okay, so let's do uh, a couple examples for funsy. I just said funsy, that's okay, why not? Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna get a few numbers up here. Whoa, that's a star. I didn't even know that could happen. Now we're now we're ready. Okay, I'm very five focused today. Okay, so in black I just have some examples for us, and we're just going to assign the number of significant figures. So I'll underline the values or the digits that are significant, and then what's not significant will not be underlined. So in this first example, we know that all three of these are significant. Why? Because they're not zeros. This zero would fall into the category of a trailing zero. Right? It's not significant. It's only acting as a placeholder. So if I were to assign the number of significant figures for this data point, it would be three significant figures. Here, all five are going to be significant. Why? Because we have all numbers that are not zero, except for this zero, which is part of a zero sandwich. Here, we have leading zeros. The only value that is significant is that two, so that is one significant figure. This last one we have a really good example because these first three zeros are not significant because those would classify as um, leading zeros, but these zeros after my two four are significant. Why? Because there's that decimal place that tells me that those zeros are indicating precision. So that is four significant figures. Then we have 965 here. All of these zeros are trailing zeros. So again, just holding place. So that is three significant figures. Pretty cool. Okay, so obviously um, we're not just going to be looking at numbers and saying how many significant figures they are. Um, although that is an important skill because you need it in order to work through mathematical operations. So we have two different considerations for significant figures depending on if it's addition and subtraction or multiplication and division. So with addition and subtraction, you're going to be limited by the um, data point with the fewest def decimal places. So let's do an example that really does a nice job of illustrating the difference in calculating significant figures for addition and subtraction versus multiplication and division. So let's say we have the number 4.35 and we're adding to it 7.2. Five, five, and that's 11. So your final answer, or your the sum of those two data points is gonna be 11.55. But we need to make sure that the value that we're reporting to is not more accurate than our individual data points. That's the whole reason why we think about significant figures. Really, really important. I work in an analytical chemistry lab, and you have to be very careful with significant figures. Make sure that the data you're reporting is um, truthful. Okay, so this data point has um, two decimal places, this data point has one. You're limited by the data point with the fewest decimal places, right? Otherwise known as the least accurate measurement. That's why accuracy and consistency are so important in the lab. So that means that I can only go to one decimal place, which means I have to round up to 11.6. So remember in rounding, you always look at your value and you, um, you round up if it's greater than or equal to five and you round down, 
if it's less than five. All right, so in multiplication and division, you have a little bit more to consider than what you do in addition and subtraction. So addition and subtraction, pretty simple. You just count the number of decimal places. The fewest, um, the fewest decimal places is what you'll report to. Multiplication and division, you have to analyze each data point and say how many significant figures you have. So let's use those same numbers, only we're going to be multiplying. And that's going to give us 31.32. Okay, so now I can't just look at decimal places. Instead, I'm going to say, okay, this has three significant figures. I picked an easy one where they're all significant. So I'm limited again to my data point with the fewest number of significant figures. So I have to round my answer to two significant figures, right? So that's going to be my first two digits. This three is less than five, so my answer would be 31. So really, really important to think about significant figures. Why? Because it's telling us um, important information about accuracy, precision of data points. We want to make sure that after our mathematical operations, we are correctly representing our data. Not to be a dead horse. Okay, so we just have one more piece for this chapter, and that is scientific notation. So we use scientific notation to represent very large or very small numbers. And in chemistry, we are sometimes talking about huge numbers, like the number of molecules in a glass of water. Or we're talking about really, really, really small numbers, like the size of an individual atom, right? Tiny number and really big number. So we have to be able to navigate that scale very fluidly. And the way that we do that is with scientific notation. So if you just have a number and like a ton of zeros afterwards, it loses meaning after a while. You know, after you get above like trillion, you're just like, I don't even know what that means. So scientific notation helps us to um, be consistent in our reporting and share data more intuitively with our peers. Because science is also a collaborative endeavor. Okay, so we have this kind of formula, if you will, which is capital N. That's my frustration sound today, I guess. Sure. Okay, so we have capital N, which is going to be a number between 1 and 9, times 10 to the lowercase n. So lowercase n is representing our power. So this lowercase n is basically telling us the number of zeros. Um, and actually it would be better for me to say number of places and we'll see why in a little bit. Capital N um, in scientific notation you always just have one number to the left of a decimal place. So let's look at an example. This is a tardigrade. They are very very fascinating microscopic creatures. Look at that thing. That exists. Biodiversity, man. So cool. Okay, so that's called the tardigrade. And this is a big number. So this is the number of tardigrades that could fit, I don't know, on like a postage stamp probably. Mm, they might be a little bigger than that. They're really small though. Okay, so if I were converting this number to scientific notation, you can see the outcome here, 5.34 times 10 to the eighth tardigrades, right? Number and unit. Um, and the way that we get to that number is by converting this very large number to something more manageable by using our power of 10. So that's what this component is called. You're using that power of 10 to act as that placeholder. So you want to think of your decimal places being here, and you would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? You always have one number to the left of that decimal place. So that's 10 to the 8. This is the number of places. You're not going to lose any of your significant figures. You need them to properly represent that data point or that value. So 5.34 times 10 to the eighth is um, the correct scientific notation. Okay.
Let's go back to this program because it's better for this. All right, so um, let me just really quickly Google world population. Ooh. Right, this is, where's my population clock? There we go. All right, so it's um, increasing quite, quite rapidly. Here we go, come on. All right, seven, seven, eight, seven, three, seven, eight, three, zero, zero. Whew, people. That's the number of people on our planet. <gasps> okay, so this is a really big number. Let's represent it with scientific notation. So we can move our decimal place. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places, right? Representing billions of people. So that would be 7.78737833, right? I'm not losing any of my significant digits times 10 to the, what was it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 10 to the ninth people, right? Always keeping that unit. Yep, it's a lot of people on our planet. Cool. Um, let's... Do another example where we're going the opposite direction. So let's see, what is the size of an X chromosome? Right, that's the chromosome that unites us all. All right, it's super small, as expected. Uh, it's the number of base pairs, the number of genes. Okay, so it is about This is the number of meters it would be. Yep. All right, so before we were representing this very large number and we had this as our scientific notation, now we're going in the opposite direction. So you want to think about converting your, um, uh, converting your numbers and the power of 10 as being basically on a scale where 10 to the zero is just like what that number is. And as you're moving the decimal place to the left, that power of 10 is going up, so it's positive. As you're moving that decimal place to the right, you're representing a really small number, and that is going to be negative. So having a negative power of 10 doesn't mean that your number is negative. It means that you're representing a really small number. Still a positive number, though. So here we're going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? Big old fat decimal point right there. So that would be 5 times 10 to the seventh, negative 7th meter. Right? Representing a very small number. So one really helpful device there is this. So if you're moving your decimal place to the left, like we did up here, then that power of 10 is increasing. It's going to become more positive. If you're moving it to the right, it is representing a small number, and that's becoming negative. So there's a ton of examples on um, your recitation where you get a lot of practice with scientific notation, so definitely work through that. Now, you're going to have to perform operations throughout this class with scientific notation, so you just want to get really familiar with your calculator, right? I've had this calculator since, like, I want to say high school, but I think this is actually newer. The one I had in high school was pretty uh, blocky, but that's okay. Um, so I've had this for a long time. It's a TI-84. I know this calculator with like the back of my hand. I don't care what calculator you have. You want it to be capable of doing scientific notation because it's going to save you a lot of time and headache, but all that really matters is that you know how to use your calculator. So. Most or all scientific calculators are going to have some way of very easily plugging in scientific notation. So in my calculator, which is a TI-84, it's a $100 calculator. You do not need a $100 calculator for this class. It's just the one that I've had forever. So for this one, there is a button, which is EE. -E. 
So if I had a value that was like 5.2 times 10 to the negative sixth, to plug that into my calculator, I would just do the 5.2. Then my EE button is actually um, a second button, which means that there's a button with multiple functions. I can hit second and use an alternative function. So I would have to hit second, and then I hit EE, and all I need to do is use negative six, which is pretty great. Um, so it's a really fast, really easy way of, of doing scientific notation. If you don't have an EE button, you might have a button that looks like 10 to the X, um, which is also pretty simple to use. The one thing that you want to be careful of is if X is a negative number, um, for some calculators you have to put it in parentheses. So you just need to make sure that you know how to use your calculator. Um, okay, so that's it for this. That's not an eraser. That's it for this lecture. Um, get some practice with scientific notation. Um, really, really going to be important for, especially once we get to chapter three. So um, that's it. The next lecture is all about units. So enjoy it.